That uh, was it. That was Discord. Okay. Hey, Good. everybody. <laughs> Here, I'm going to do this. Cat down screen, and we're going to go live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another another installment of Beer School, completely free of technical difficulties. We're all good. Uh, today, what I was hoping to do is to discuss the <coughs> beers of Quebec and what the brewing scene there is like. Uh, I've invited Giggle back. You might remember him from the second beer school that we did. Uh, he lives in Montreal, um, and yep. he is uh, deeply invested in the beer scene there. Please go ahead and give us a little intro of yourself. So yeah, my, my name is Giggle from uh, Montreal. I've been uh, streaming for the past two years and a half. I uh, really enjoy drinking beer and I uh, have been invested into a, an organization, a non-lucrative organization uh, that's called LABAC, L-A-B-A-Q, uh, which is the association that represents the microbrewers of our province. Now, for those out there that didn't know, uh, Quebec is located just up north of the uh, United States to the eastern part and is mostly Francophone. So you might recognize my accent there as well. Um, now, the beer, uh, and we're, that's exactly what uh, we're going to be talking about today, the beer that's from Quebec has been uh, very influential throughout uh, the recipes that have been growing all across the United States for the past uh, decade or so. And then uh, I figured that my friend here is inviting me to talk about those and actually enjoy uh, drinking some because now uh, there's some of them are available uh, to, uh, all across the United States. We picked four from four different organizations, but there's way more than that as well. And we're going to also talk about them if we can. Yeah. Um, so let's take let's yeah, let's just do basics uh, to start with. Um, what makes uh, Quebec different from the other provinces of Canada? Uh, there, there are growing scenes into the micro breweries and the major breweries all across Canada. Uh, Quebec is very special because it's part of the oldest provinces, uh, for sure, for one. For two, uh, we did develop a very close relationship with uh, the brewers uh, from especially Belgium, but also from Ireland and uh uh, Great Britain, all, all over the place. So, but yeah, the beers that we have here is very much influenced and uh, get uh, a lot of the yeast and the ingredients uh, from the Belgium yeah, culture. Definitely, when I think of uh, yeah beers from Quebec or uh, from Montreal specifically, I, I think of Belgian style beers. Um, and I've never been there, but the the beers that come our way, at least, are. Uh, the def definitely beers are mostly Belgian influenced. Yep. And that's, I would assume, mostly because of the heavily uh, French population and French dry population of Quebec. Um, well, we do have a different culture uh, from the rest of Canada, for sure, but every province has their own specialities. And when it comes to beer, uh, it really came with the love of beer. Uh, it, it's been a while. Molson has been established here. Uh, it's part of the 181st organization that has been established in Montreal. It's one of the oldest building here and is still functioning. Uh, and now, uh, as you guys may know, uh, they actually uh, co-joined with Coors. Uh, so uh, they're, they're very much all across the United States as well. Yeah, Molson Coors. Well, when the, when the Anheuser buyout happened and there was Miller Coors and then they had to split certain things up. And so now the company's reformed as Molson Coors and it's hard yep. to keep track of who owns who and what goes where. But, yep. uh, but the, the old time history of brewing in Quebec in terms of the big boys, uh, definitely Molson, um, Labatt and Le Carling too, right? Yep. And those were big, were and are big industrial brewers. Oh yeah, primarily making you know very low flavor pilsner style beers. Um, and I don't know, do they have specialty beers they would make throughout the year, or is it really just those? Uh, they're they're actually looking into uh, expanding their range of beers. That's uh, as this scene is very very strong right now. And so what uh, Molson has been doing and other organizations as well is they've been acquiring uh, micro brewers. Uh, so instead of just growing on their own and trying new recipes and stuff, they're just 
they went along and they're buying the ones that are doing great and they think they can actually bring uh, further more into the market everywhere. So I think similarly to the way that things went in the US um, in the 1980s and 1990s, smaller breweries started to pop up, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, there, there, there's been a sequence where there was a lot of micro breweries that popped up in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And there was a lot change and they pretty much all died uh, from there. The scene just went and it was only the major uh, big organization that were brewing at that time or it was only them that were mostly available. And then uh, the scene changed beginning in the 90s with uh, Unibrew. So we're going to have one of Unibrew. I'm... Uh, uh, what? This one. So uh, La Fin du Monde. So Unibrew uh, was actually a creation of a... Uh, very well-known singer in Quebec uh, that has spent many years into California. And uh, actually, I think he lives part-time in Florida, too, and all across the States and all across the world, actually. He was really uh, known worldwide, and he's still very known. Uh, uh, Charles Bois, he's called. And, and um, he played song with Zappa and stuff. Like, he, like back in the beginning of the 70s, like, he was, he was kind of major. And then he was really into this industry and uh, created Unibrew. Uh, with a couple of friends and story goes that uh, one of his uncles was actually uh, one of the ones that actually brought back or brought in uh, uh, white beers that they got uh, removed from our market from a very long time ago because people weren't interested in two fuzzy beers and they brought it back and now it's uh, what's it called whole garden mm -hmm. you know who knows whole garden so yeah that's all associated with bringing it back and bringing some some flavors to the beers that weren't inevitable other than you could maybe have access to uh, Guinness and some 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 stouts and some of those beers uh, but they weren't inevitable so yeah the, the the scene grew from there very quickly and now um, I was just looking into it there's currently uh, I think it's over 530 micro breweries that are uh, active and uh, so many more are growing. So yeah, the, that's each page is, is a different uh, microbrewery in Quebec right now. That's uh, the latest Bible that came out, and it's 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 funny because it's it's a growing scene in Ontario, it's a growing scene in Vancouver and all across Canada. But the thing is, uh, in Vermont and all other states around Quebec too. So it's not only Quebec. But the law prevents us from uh, moving, and, and, and there's no beer from other provinces that comes within this province. So we had to create our own culture. Um, and our beer doesn't travel very well within the Canada. And surprisingly enough, uh, the, the border with the United States has been more open than uh, transporting alcohol in between provinces. And Canada has a nationalized liquor distributor, right? Yeah. And so how does that work? Because that's somewhat different from most of the states in the United States. Uh, actually, there's not one that's uh, only in Canada. There's one in Quebec that's um, the Alcohol Society. Uh, that's um, a provincial government run society. Um, and then the laws that are applied to uh, alcohol that are over 15 percent, if I remember right, are uh, laws from the Canadian government. But when it comes to laws for beers, uh, that's the the provincial governments that take care of it. So it's actually, it's easier to find, would you say that it's easier to find beers from Quebec in the United States than it is in the rest, rest of Canada? Canada? Yeah, probably. Really from what I'm hearing, it is, yeah. yeah. And Now, Unibrou isn't uh, owned by, by Quebec anymore. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not only, a, a, I mean, Unibrou was bought by Sleeman, and then Sleeman was bought by Sapporo. So technically, it's a Japanese beer now, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and how, how many, many years, years ago, ago was that? Uh, beginning in the 2000 year. Okay. And if I remember right, uh, when Unibrou was launched, it was launched with something like a million dollar, like which is really a big investment back in the days, but it was sold for something like $25 million mm -hmm. uh, 15 years after. So that's that's pretty great when you think about it. Yeah, and they're easily the uh, most widely recognized beer from Quebec that you'll find in the States. Um, and they do some private label brewing for Trader Joe's, which is a uh, grocery store chain here in the United States that's owned by Aldi. 
and um, they're special. Do they, they do an anniversary beer every year, right? Like a reserve anniversary yep. beer. Um, that gets relabeled yep. for uh, Trader Joe's. And, um, but Le Fin du Bon, and uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other beers that they make off the top of my head. Um, uh, oh, they have plenty. Yeah, it's just... Uh, um, yeah. Uh, One thing's for sure is that all of the beers that they're making uh comes from a yeast that's uh, specifically from belgium mm -hmm. and um i was told that this yeast uh, for the micro brewers if you guys are interested is actually available one time a year is produced by uh california lab so if you guys are interested in uh, doing some dupes sometimes the recipes are are there and uh, accessible actually uh it's there's nothing hidden about the recipes it's just sometimes getting the ingredients is harder and i know for uh Unibrew, it's actually available to get some sometimes. Uh, let me look at... Uh, well, I can, uh, yeah, I can go to the list, but I'll leave the uh, French pronunciations to giggle. But, um, yeah. Uh, the Blanche de Chambly, which is uh, yeah. a very easy to find wit beer that they make. Uh, Chambly Noir, which they make. Um, I think, is that more of a holiday beer? Um, well... When, I'm not sure if they have one more for holiday, actually. Okay. Uh, but one thing's for sure is like most of the beers that they do uh, and brew are usually strong beers, mm -hmm. very strong beers. So that really defines what they do. Uh, they actually make one for uh, Megadeth, for fans of Megadeth out there. They have a specific brew that's uh, been brewed for them. That's available all, all across the province here. I'm not sure how outside uh, the province, if it's available in the States. Mm -hmm. I, I would guess so. Um, but yeah, they've been... Uh, They've been supporting, and that's pretty much. I think it's part of the success of the, all those more micro breweries. They've they've been very very supportive of uh, music scene and and every uh, community and and event, and they've been into it and financing it and making sure that they've been seen and people that had access to their product had a chance to taste them had a chance to get drunk on them too, obviously because it's strong beers, and uh, people were having fun and decided, you know what uh they do appreciate the fact that they can have access to something that tastes different than horse piss <laughs> uh but yeah uh trois pistoles um uh the ephemera yep. beers they make a lot of uh fruit belgian style fruit beers um yeah and the quad that they make uh la terrible uh yeah but yeah, their beers. So I don't are, have a list in front of me, but yeah, yeah. but their beers are yeah. generally easy to find here. And like I said, the Trader Joe's uh, vintage beers that they put out every year um, are uh, usually pretty easy to get a hold of too. I think they're still doing those. Um, they have all the years listed here, so if you uh, pop into a Trader Joe's, you can grab one of those around uh, Christmas time. But uh, when we get into the beers, we're gonna do we're gonna drink Le Fin de Mon, um, which is the end of the world. Uh, which is one of the first beers that I remember having when I was first getting into beer when I was, you know, like in high school. Um, and then we were also going to have beers from uh, Dude Seal. Yeah. And so Dude Seal, yes. Um, you, you, you got it. Uh, and then who brews the Apocalypse beer? La Trou de Diable. Exactly. The Trou du Diable uh, that are located in Shawinigan, uh, Judicia that are located, I think they were first located in Montreal, but now their big brewery has been moved to uh, saint jean just up uh, north to Montreal. Uh, and those places, like we talked, uh, Chambly, uh, Shawinigan, uh, saint jean and then uh, this is on the South Shore for the last one. Uh, very accessible place for very good, uh, good water. Uh, that that makes it a lot easier for brewers. Obviously, that's that's an important ingredient. Yeah, and then the last brewery is the Three Musketeers, or what's the French yeah, pronunciation les, of les, Three Musketeers? Les, les Trois Musketeers. There you go. Which reference to uh, the the Three Musketeers uh, in uh, in the story in France? Mm -hmm. So, um, talked a little about the history of Quebec and. Um, and brewing, what, what would you say that the, the brewing scene is like now? Um, what, what's going on now? Where are things heading? Uh, what kind of, are there any specific trends or um, what are people into right now? I think the, the trends have been pretty much following what's been 
done throughout America. There's there's nothing very special in terms of trends. Um, a lot of Belgian beers, a lot of, uh, and then that's something very specific that I learned also recently is that the beers here are often, very often identified by their colors more than their style. Hmm. And so when you speak with someone, they're like, oh, it's a blonde, oh, it's a white beer, or it's a dark beer, or it's a brown beer, and or a red dale, right? Um, but it's not exactly a, cl- a classification that's widely used outside of this province. It's just something that's commonly used here. And so there's been, there actually, there's a lot going on, but it's not necessarily trends. It's just uh, a lot of uh, New Zealand hops have been flowing in. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, trying with, you know, uh, playing with, with uh, yeast and all sorts of different ways to be brewing laggering uh is something very difficult and more and more breweries are tempted to uh to 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 tackle this task to do good laggers as well so cool that's and then sours uh last year it's been all about sours mm-hmm. uh a year before that uh it was all about uh, i don't know how to pronounce it night pa uh, like new england uh, style ipas yeah mm-hmm. exactly it, it was all about that too so and then in this case, funny enough, like uh, if you look at, uh, I think it's La Fin du Monde, uh, which is a Brett. So that's uh, another one too. Uh, Brett has been very, very, very popular for the past couple of years too. I'm personally not a big fan of Brett's usually, but every now and then uh, they can be quite good at also. <clears throat> yeah, I would assume with um, that Belgian influence that you would get the entire range of Belgian style beers, especially a spontaneous fermentation or wild beers that in- intentionally have Britannomyces or Lactobacillus or Pediococcus added. And that's a funny thing. The spontaneous uh, fermentation process has just been given one permit for one microbrewers. Uh, they just recently started to do it. Obviously, other have been playing around with it, mm-hmm. but he couldn't sell it. It wasn't legal up, all, up until now. There's been an opening onto the uh, law scene, onto one could be experimenting. Uh, I, I know it's something that's a bit more frequent when you go somewhere else, but here was considered uh, unhygienic. Wow. Up until this microbrewery was, uh, had a permission to actually go ahead. Uh, and they're very closely seen, and, and they're looking into it to see if they're going to be able to open and give it this uh, to others. That's a, that's a really unusual way of thinking because um yeah it, like historically in the united states um from a practical sense uh the tax and trade bureau is the government organization who sees breweries and makes sure that you're paying your taxes and doing everything by the book but it's not the health department because beer can't make somebody sick right it's not like cheese where if you make no. bad cheese you can die or if you are making a distillate and you make really bad distillate, you can make somebody go blind, right? Beer, yeah. you can't hurt anybody with beer. You can make a really terrible tasting no. beer, but it's not going to hurt you. So it's always been under no. the purview of just the Tax and Trade Bureau, which used to be um, part of the ATF. But <clears throat> regardless, so when the health inspector would come through, it would be like, what are you doing here? There's nothing to inspect. Like, even if you make the worst beer in the world, you can't get somebody hurt. So the idea that... Uh, unhygienic beer or beer that's wildly fermented or spontaneously fermented is unhygienic is a very unusual way of thinking. No. And, and this is part of uh, the reason why Labac is something that we want to, you know, make sure that we do the right um, lobbying uh, with the government and making sure that they do understand that this is beer has been brewed for thousands of years. And as far as we know, nobody has ever died from it. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, of course, if you're drunk and you're going to be driving, that's an issue. And then, of course, it's going to be part of how they're going to be looking at microbrewers and the accessibility and exchanges and taxes that are related to it. Um, but when it comes to the hygiene part, it's always this mention of, oh, well, you know, it's the same organization that's going to be coming closing you down if you do uh, a contest or if you exchange beers in a way that isn't supposed to be done. Uh, it, it's not the the, the fisc uh, for the taxes that's going to be doing so. That's going to be the, uh, uh, the the same people that are going to be closing down restaurants because they're unhygienic, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so the same inspector, same laws that are going to be applying. And do you have a link uh, that you can put in chat for Labac? Is there a 
Facebook page or yeah, web page well, or anything like that? Sure, I'll uh, write it down. It's very easy. So it's labaq.ca. So I'll uh, link it in chat so that you guys can actually see it. Um, right here should be good. There you go. So, all right, well, back. I think I'm ready for a beer. Yeah, um, what? I wasn't too sure which one we should start with. Uh, those are all very strong and very specific mm -hmm. beer. Um, I maybe would go with, I don't know, let's start. The, what about the Stickle Halt from uh, yeah, the Red one. Lager? Yeah, yeah. So, this I, is I'd, um... I'd be tempted. A little unusual because uh, Sticky Alt is a uh, Dusseldorf style of beer, basically. It's one of the kind of um, hybrid uh, German styles um, where, uh, you know, many German cities are known for making very specific styles of beer. Um, around Bamberg, they make beers with smoke malt. Um, in Cologne, they make Kolsch. Um, in Dusseldorf, they make alt beer. And so this is uh, in the alt beer style. So it should be a kind of an amber colored lager and a little bit higher bitterness than you'd expect from a typical German pills. Um, and I think it's gonna be interesting to see too, um, Giggle and I were talking before the stream started about uh, ages on beers and formats. Yep. And um, this one specifically for me is a, um, it's about a 22 ounce bottle, uh, one pint, one pint, 9.4 ounces. I don't know why they don't have milliliters on here. I'm sure it's a 750 or something like that. But um, uh, yeah, it looks like a 750. Yeah. And then this is a big beer and I don't see any kind of date on it for them. So the other ones I know definitely so, had dates. This one yeah. does not specifically, but we'll we'll jump in here. Mine it says it was uh, the date of the product is on the thirteenth of February two thousand and seventeen. Um, it also says that it's been aged a minimum of twelve months, and it should be drank at around six to ten degrees Celsius. Hmm, I wonder if we got the same beer because uh, wait, yours has been aged twelve months before it was bottled. Or you're saying it's good uh, yep. to age for 12 months? Um, it doesn't say. It just said aging. Oh, okay. I'm, um, I would not expect this with... to be an aged beer. Maybe they're saying that it's good for a year, or they would expect it to be good for a year. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, aging 12 months. My guess is that they're saying it's good for 12 months, but they don't have a date on here, so you have no idea how long oh. 12 months is. <laughs> Oh, it's sad. Uh, I, I know, uh, and then we were mentioning, uh, all of those beers that we're going to be drinking today obviously won many contests. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very well known for uh, being good quality. If we just go ahead and uh, look at it, it's a uh, fairly dark red. Um, and it's pretty clean too, but... Uh, yeah, mine's nice and bright, nice amber color. Uh yeah let's see it says a flavor that uh, you associate with are uh, toasted bread caramel nuts herbal and raisins so mine's definitely a bit oxidized right off the bat that's not super unexpected um there is a really great liquor store here in chicago called west lakeview liquors and i was able to pick up three of these there they carry a, a pretty good selection of beers from quebec um and uh, uh, Giggle, I think, was actually pretty surprised when I showed him the photos from when I was in the store trying to pick up beers. So the yeah. way that we picked these four beers were what I had available since the beers that he's going to have uh, available are a lot different. But um, so, yeah, let me let's dig into this. Yeah. And, and surprisingly enough, uh, here in Quebec, we do have a, like a super fun and 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 present scene with the beers and we have like uh, corner places that have like over 300 uh, sort of, of beers and everything it's 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 widely available it's it's very fun but then again it's all beers that are coming from here it's very very hard for us to be getting any sorts of beer that are outside the province uh, yeah it's it's a all it, one of the only ways we are actually sometimes able to get them is if they're uh re-brewed uh, in the province 
or if they have somewhat of an agreement like Heineken's or, or you know, those big ones that are, and, and even then sometimes they're, they're, they're becoming harder and harder to find because the scene here is very much uh, onto uh, the beer that has been brewed here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's pretty sad. Like I, I would, uh, I would like some more influence and uh, would like to have access to what's been brewed in, in Ontario and Vermont and all across the States. Right. Um, so yeah, that would be great if there was some more opening to it. Yeah. But then again, there's so many of them here. Uh, I'm not sure how the scene here would react to it. Liquor laws are confusing, especially when they're limiting to that effect. Like it, uh, who does it benefit, right? Yeah. So yeah. So this is um, this is pretty nice, despite the oxidation. Um, it it listed as only being six percent, but. It, yeah. it is a bit warming, um, more so than I would expect a 6% beer, ABV beer to be. Um, but some nice um, roasted and caramel malts are coming through. Um, it definitely has yeah. an assertive bitterness, which is what I would expect for the style. They're, they actually, the ingredients are in the bottle. Mm -hmm. That's, I find it very impressive. You have 100% malt from uh, the Quebec province. Pils Pilsner, Pell, Clara, 60 slash uh, 160 so you do have like everything yeah uh, if anybody would want to do them at home you have all the details it's a very interesting uh i, I don't see everyone do that and they're going to tell you what you can actually drink it with if you want to match it with some food um hot sausage grilled meat soft uh, some semi soft cheese which uh yeah i would actually see that with uh with uh, what's been mentioned there. So, yeah. Good for barbecue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then they, they list uh, three German hops, uh, Magnum, Northern, Northern Brewer, and Hollertau, and 74 IBUs. So 74 IBUs is definitely up there, especially um, especially for, uh, you know, a lager, but something for a Dusseldorf-style all beer, it is right, I think, right in line and, um, and pretty nice. Yeah. Um, I I know um, I I do know uh, this brewer, uh, Les Trois Mousquetaires. I I don't remember drinking this one specifically. I know you have like uh, at least fifteen kinds that are out there uh, that are fun to go to. So I I don't remember uh, drinking this one before. So I'm fairly happy to have a chance to do so. Cool. Um, do you know? Uh, this brewery pretty, pretty well. well. I mean, in, in terms, terms of their beers, is this um, what kind um, of range of beers do they make? Or sure. they... I, I did get a, their backstory here a bit earlier because I, I I was supposed to go visit them the other day, but then it didn't happen. Let me bring uh, up the uh, rate beer listing right here for them. So, in terms so they opened up on June two thousand and four. Um, and the Brassard, which is on the south shore of Montreal, mm -hmm. very, very close to. And uh, they've been known for a couple of beers like uh, D'Artagnan La Ramis, which are the names of the three musketeers. Uh, and they've been uh, going along with that. And they've been playing a lot with within, like I said before, the brackets of the colors. Like I feel they have like a white one, they have a, a lager, they have you know, it's it's very very mm -hmm. like into to like if the, their beer tend to fit into the squares uh, that uh, people are expecting from sorts of beer, right? They're they're not, as far as I remember, their beers are nothing too funky. They're they're very classical beers and very classical recipes, but they're well made. They're well very well made. A lot so, of beers um, brewed to style, yeah. yeah. And the uh, the rate beer listings overall ninety and style rating ninety eight. So those are reasonably high, um, uh, especially for uh, alt is not really a style that people get super excited about on the beer websites. So pretty good rating. I did smile when you yep. uh, pronounced as we would say here in Chicago, D'Artagnan. D'Artagnan. <laughs> D'Artagnan. Uh, yeah. So yeah, they've been going along with this uh, this thing there. It's it's they've been like a great organization. It's a reliable product. It's a super nice gift that you can bring to someone that's 
maybe not into anything too funky or you just want to go and have a barbecue with friends and you don't want to mess with the food that they're going to be cooking let's say you know they're going to be doing something relatively like fun on their own you don't want to ruin it you just want to bring something that goes along mm -hmm. i i feel like uh Uh, this this brewery, the Trois Mousquetaires, would be very reliable. You won't get onto oh, what the hell is that? That's way too whatever, right? Uh, like some some people don't like IPAs or they're way too strong in the IBUs and stuff. I mean, I like them, but uh, that really goes along. It's a bit more classic, mm -hmm. but they, they're well done classic. So, what do you want to try next? Um. You know what? Let's jump to La Fin du Monde. Okay. I think that would be relevant to jump to La Fin du Monde in this, uh, this part because the IBU and I have a feeling that the Belgium style uh, yeast is not too far from this one somehow. Okay. Now, in my case, I did uh, buy a six pack. So there are smaller mm -hmm. ones and I was told not to do so. Not to buy the six pack? Yeah, I was told to buy the the, the big bottles that you have mm -hmm. with uh, the the corks uh, that you uh, you take off. Oh, uh, because uh, as it seems, is yours yeah, not as bottle as conditioned, or is it different, or what? I was told that the taste is different. Uh, this one is kind of tasteless, so I just wanted to try it out because I usually get the the format that you currently okay. have in your hands. So this is a Belgian style triple. Um, and if we talk about uh, Belgian style beers, um, a a single, a double, and a triple are from the monastic tradition of brewing. And um, a single would be a like a table beer, um, an easy to drink, um, low ABV beer that monks would drink uh, during the day. Um, and then a double is typically a darker. Um, brown or caramel colored beer that is usually has lots of dark fruit flavors, um, raisins, dates, uh, that sort of thing, um, usually a little bit stronger. And then a triple is typically a pale colored beer um, that is often very high in ABV, uh, usually eight, nine uh, percent or above. This one is nine. Um, and like yep. I said, um, When I first started getting into uh, beers, this is um, one that was easily accessible and a really great style of a Belgian style triple that um, was much more accessible than when you, you know, in the late 90s when getting beers from Belgium was uh, significantly more difficult. So uh, ale brewed with spices. And then um, the other thing about Unibrew's beers is you'll often see on the label, um, It'll say beer on lees or ale on lees, which oh, uh, yeah. which means that um, that there is a little bit of yeast sediment in the bottom of the beer. So yeah, in this case, I don't see much, but I remember back in the '90s when it was one of the only thing that was actually good and available. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would I obviously fuck you up real fast at nine percent. So. You get a couple of those, and there you go. You have a very good night yeah. on your own. That's the and, reason and... why it's called the end of the world. Yep. And, and um, I do remember that there used to be in those bottles a lot, a lot of yeast. Uh, nowadays, it's a bit more clear. I guess they've been working on their process uh, to tune it down. But it used to be like outrageous a lot uh, back in the day. So whoever got the last glass, like really, <laughs> <laughs> we got all of it. They got some extra vitamins. Uh, this also yeah. says... Um, brewed with spices. They don't specify mm -hmm. what spices, but I can guess that yep. it's probably coriander and yep. um, maybe orange peel. Kind of similar to a wit beer. Um, yeah. I don't know that there's orange peel yeah, you, in here. I'm just guessing. So. There's, there's something that, that goes along with the, the orange peel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, coriander, uh, but very a, a little bit too common, actually, in those styles of beer, in, in my opinion. But They were one of the first ones, so we can't really complain about the other ones, right? But um, super, super easy to drink. Um, the 9% mm -hmm. is extremely well hidden. Um, it, you can feel the warming, but there's no alcohol abrasiveness or, uh, or unpleasant alcohol character. Um, really, no. really nice, smooth 9% beer. Um, 
rapier has this listed as 98 overall and 100% on the style. Um, it's a it's a really great example of the Belgian style triple. I, I, I have a feeling, and then and I might have a wrong feeling about this, but yeah, growing, uh, I remember drinking a lot of those, and it used it used to taste a lot more alcohol than it is now. I feel hmm. like they changed their recipe or their process. They refined it at some point. Um, and there are some batches that you can really, really taste, like banana flavors. Uh, okay. Yeah, and that, that comes obviously from the... Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, this is also uh, another important point about bottle conditioned beers. Um, you can see this really brilliant, beautiful head. Um, when the beer is um, re-fermented in the bottle and when it's packaged with this uh, corking cage, you get uh, a very champagne-like finish with the beer and you get um, really fine, I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see it on the camera, but um, really fine uh bubbles that are much smaller than you get when you force carbonate a beer because it's the natural co2 that's getting um yeah. given off by the yeast during the fermentation so it's eating up the sugars making alcohol and co2 and it's dissolving that co2 into solution and you just get a really nice um fine head that you can't get during forced fermentation no, it's it's very very pleasant. The mouthfeel of those bubbles is very very pleasant. You you can actually feel how how great it is. It's thick. It's it's just it goes everywhere in your mouth, and you're happy with that. And I haven't had this beer in a really long time, and it's actually still quite nice and as good as I remember it. Sometimes you have a beer especially when it was early on in your drinking career and you think, Oh man, that beer yeah. was amazing. Like I, I very distinctly remember being at a party in high school and somebody had a bottle of rogue dead guy and nobody wanted to drink it because it was like way too crazy and way too strong. And it was like, yeah. wow, this is super really, this is really exciting. And then you go back and maybe have it again later and it's not the same thing that you remember at all. Um, I remember and, and some of the beers have evolved, actually. That's that's one thing that I want to point out. Mm -hmm. Like Don de Dieu that was mentioned in chat, um, just saying hi to Sassy Fanny Pack. Um, the Don de Dieu is a beer that evolved and really changed. At first, it was just uh, they were making it as an event. Uh, they were making it evitable, let's say, for Christmas time. And they were very limited. And every year, the, the recipe changed a little till a point where uh, it had been 10 years they'd been making it, and now they made it available, different formats, way cheaper than it was because it used to be something like really, really pricey. You'd get one bottle and you'd be like, oh yeah, I got my bottle this year, I could find one. And um, and now they're settled onto a recipe that's, that's very fun, uh, but I remember how to try it. And some years it wasn't all, all, all that good. So I remember having one that just exploded in, in my hands. Like it, it just, it would never stop. Uh, it was just too crazy. And they, they were playing with the alcohol percentages. They were playing with some of the ingredients. And I think uh, as soon as they hit up like the 10 years of this process, it's 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 been super available. Uh, same thing with the FMR. Uh, so they have one um, with uh, apple. Mm -hmm. uh, they have one with, uh, I think it's cherry. They have one with uh, peaches. And all sorts of other Pretty ingredients, fruit, yeah. and they used to make it very limited availability uh, when came time to uh, to those fruits, and they usually also were available like end of the fall only for a couple of months. It, that's if you can find some. Mm. Uh, but nowadays, you can pretty much find some all up throughout the year. Uh, they've been able to. Uh, increase production for those products for sure, especially the apple one. I know sells really well here in the states because it's. Um... It's extremely accessible for people who maybe don't care for beer as much and you can offer that to them yeah. and say hey look here's like a green apple beer and it's fruity and you know easy to drink yeah, yeah. oh it's it's great i loved it i loved it i i, I think i drank way too much of it <laughs> at some point yeah oh, i mean it was good it was just i mean that's the only thing or barely the only things that were available back in the day uh i mean micro brewers were existing but they were not bottling they were not. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any transportation facilities. They didn't have any access to sell into local stores. You either had to go and find a very specific store that would have them, and there were very few of them back then. Nowadays, they're all over the place, right? Um, but uh, that 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 really changed the scene of the beer. 
that's that's where it comes from also the fact that uh, there was a demand and people were open to the idea of paying a bit more for better beers than buying Molson's or Coors or Miller's. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I forgot to mention, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Mondial de la Beer? The beer festival in Montreal? I'm sorry, I, I lost oh, you Oh, can you second. tell us a little bit about uh, Mondial de la Beer, the big beer festival they have every year? Uh, yeah, well, Mondial de la Beer uh, has been... I think it's 15, 20 years now mm -hmm. and it's been happening. Um, that's a very fun event that I haven't been so much. I've been to other events that are similar. Uh, but Mondial de Bière is, uh, is very interesting But because at this event, you can actually get beer from all across the world. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that's, that's very fun. Um, but it's also very crowded. And I haven't been for the last couple of years because they moved. They used to be down uh, at Bonaventure Station. Uh, they had a really nice place, but an outside place to go. And it was just a really nice place to be. And then somehow, last couple of years, they moved to Palais des Congrès, which is a gray, closed environment. I It, it has nothing to do with this kind of scene, but... That's, that's what they decided to do. So I just, I figured I was going to be investing my money on two other festivals. Mm. And that's what I did. But yeah, it's a very fun event. Still have a, the, you go and you buy like tickets. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the beers you're going to be buying, it's for a third of a beer. So you have uh, beer shooters. I think I have one of, uh, back there, I could bring one. So it's beer shooters. That's one third of a beer, right? And some beers will be one ticket, some beers will be two, three, four. I tasted the uh, Black Porter, I think it was seven tickets. So seven tickets was $7 for a third of a beer. Mm -hmm. And then back then you're like, wow, that's <laughs> great. But you see nowadays, uh, it isn't that much. And people are more and more open to be drinking beers that are uh, costier. Last night I was having a beer with a friend and he decided to bring a bottle of, uh, it's not this one, but that size. It was twenty five dollar. Mm -hmm. Here you go. It's uh, it's like a nice, very nice uh, product that you can actually share with a friend. That's worth every penny, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But it's not everyone that's open to be paying that price for beer. Yeah, the, there's definitely so, a big um, mental divide that it, we as brewers have to uh, try to educate people in terms of. Many people will not blink at spending. 30, 40, 50 dollars on a 750 milliliter bottle of wine, but yep. you have a bottle of beer the exact same size, and it could be something extremely special. And when you ask somebody to pay 15 dollars or 20 dollars for a bottle that size, they're just completely aghast because they can't imagine that any beer would be worth that, let alone something that's special that Wait. actually justifies the price. I mean, I, I do understand wines are, are something that I do appreciate as well. But you think of the blends and the difficulty level uh, and all of the flavoring that you have in beers, all of the ingredients that are like coming along and all the matches. And it's just for me, it's it's it's, it's you can't take him out of this this route where it's going to be absolutely amazing all the the mixes and everything that you're going to be put into it all the specialists that are that got involved into developing and importing and, and growing those ingredients that are now available and specific of course uh those types of product are going to be available and people are getting educated into uh sorts of beers they actually appreciate they're they're more and more open to be tasting different stuff so uh nowadays it's uh it, i think it's worth it to be going to a friend and then usually what you you never go to a friend or, or to family uh with your hands um, nothing in your hands right i that's how i grew up every time i'm going to be invited to go someplace i'm going to bring something and for the longest time people were bringing bottles of wine mm -hmm. and nowadays it's changed people are bringing nice bottles of beer mm -hmm. i mean why not yeah uh and before wines, it was most likely bringing bottles of cognac or bringing bottles of, uh, you know, whatever you had out there that was fun to drink. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah there's, there's there's no, no reason. reason. And, and and for my money, money in, in terms, terms of if you're going, going to like a dinner party, party or something, beer is so much more flexible in terms of pairing with different beverages or, um, you know, just accessible in terms of uh, flavor flexibility than white or red. And of course, there's a lot more complexity. In, in wines oh, yeah. than that, but um, 
I mean, I think beer wins hands down every time in terms of food pairing. And, and I mean, I do appreciate wines a lot. I do appreciate every sort of alcohol uh, or, or practically, but uh, wine isn't cheap either when you start <laughs> thinking about it. it. It really isn't. And at the end of the day, I'm not always keen to be opening a bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just want to relax and have a beer. You don't necessarily open a bottle of wine and just have like one glass of wine, especially if it comes to a very pricey. And then you know it's not going to taste the same. It's going to oxidize by next day, even if you get like most of the oxygen in the bottles mm -hmm. with uh, bottle the thingy. Oxygen. But it's it's still it's not going to be the same. You know it's not going to be the same. So if you're all by yourself, you want to or with your girlfriend, you're watching a movie, uh, you're having popcorn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not gonna be I don't know, some... like a bottle of wine with popcorn. Some burgundy. Seriously, I I, I don't know. You, let's let's have a nice beer instead, right? Maybe some uh, so. five dollar grocery store Lambrusco, but nothing expensive, right? Yeah. All right, you ready for another one? What should we do next? Yes. You know what? Let's go with. Uh, I I'm gonna keep that uh, apocalypse soul for the last because okay. I know it's fucking ridiculous. It's great. Uh, triple white IPA, but the IPA part, I think it's going to ruin everything else after. So let's go with the uh, Bière uh, Dernière Volonté. Okay, so your label is much different from mine. I was worried that we didn't have the same beer. Yes. Yeah, it's actually very different. So I'll, I'll make sure to show it. I, I know you guys have been looking at it, but it's this one. Yeah. Okay, so this is a, um, an Abbey style blonde ale. So we talked about uh, triples and doubles and singles. This is another. Um, Belgian style Abbey beer, and it's twist off. Yep, mine is, anyways. Oh, the bubbles on this one is that uh, it's freaking so amazing. So, the label describes I've this been... as uh, the last will mix of Belgian yep. and English brewing traditions. Uh, let's see, Belgian yeast. Uh, dry hopped, which is not super typical for an Abbey style blonde, but that should be uh, a little interesting twist. Nice bright yep. blonde beer. Every time I try to put this beer in front of the green screen, it goes Ghostbusters on me. <laughs> so this guy, this beer is mentioned on the bottle in my end. Anyways, it says it has aging potential. Um, so. Present fresh, hoppy mm. aromas, delicate overtone of spice, and literary characteristic of bre balderbrets. So on mine, there are two notches here on the date, but the or the on the numbers, but they only go from zero to nine, and there's two listings from zero to nine. So I'm not super sure what the date is supposed to be of when this was packaged. Well, you know what? This one's also on my end, backed in February 2017. Okay. So pretty much the same date as I'm the not, Stickle Halt. And I'm not really sure how to decipher that. Uh, the, those notches. One says three, and one says five. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. So it's very correct. Like you can't fucking read anything. No. <laughs> so this mine does not smell super fresh. There's definitely some oxidation going on. I would not describe this as a dry hopped aroma at all. I'm not sure how long this has been sitting on the shelf. Yeah, those tend to disappear with time, eh? Definitely has some. So, Go ahead. So as I mentioned before, uh, Judiciel is also part of the first ones from the 300 and 500 something ones. Uh, they, uh, like I mentioned, started in Montreal in uh, 1998 and uh, it really comes from a Belgium uh, that that the tradition they wanted to explore and they wanted to bring bring it furthermore in my opinion from what I tasted from the Ciel, they have been very open to be making all sorts of beer and pushing it further every time they're trying and so where they started, they actually were brewing uh, smaller quantities, uh, which I think it's mentioned here. I think it was a hundred liter per batches, and then they moved on and bought and and created a big brewery in uh, 
then uh, Saint Jérôme, which is further north from Montreal, and now they're brewing like two thousand liters batches instead of a hundred, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's much more, and they've they've been uh, selling all over the place. They've been very present. Um, all of the beers that I've tasted from them, I actually appreciated it. They've been going with uh, all sorts of ingredients that no other breweries were using or are still using. Um, they're 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 flavoring. They're very good on using like all those flowers and fruits that are very tropical and we don't even know what you know i never heard of before and it's, they've, they've been very very fun to uh, be exploring and trying stuff <clears throat> so in the tradition of uh, like fmi doing like uh, apples and and fruits that we know of they've been doing the same and exploring with fruits that i've never heard of mm-hmm. uh, which makes it very interesting this is listed at seven percent um, and it's another beer that does not have a super strong, um, uh, the alcohol character, I mean, it's there, but it's not right in your face. It's, it's well hidden. Oh yeah. Uh, the bubbles on this one are really amazing on my end. Hmm. It says a Belgian style funky IPA. Hmm. Wait, where does it say that? Uh, the front of the bottle, I oh, okay. have that. Yeah. Mine says, Voulez-vous coucher avec moi? That's weird. Oh, really? <laughs> oh. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> oh, yeah. You see, like, the, the foam I, I is very, very thick, and I, I never, like, it's not going down like it's staying up mm-hmm. it's it's very very fun very bubbly and uh, you know what the breath isn't uh, too strong I, that's something that i usually am not that keen on looking into a beer breaths um i don't know everybody's making been making some for the past uh, couple of years now i feel people have been exaggerating into how they're using the breaths mm-hmm. and in this case it's very light very, very, very light. Yeah, I, for me, there's no Brett character in here at all. Um, do they make two different versions? Do they make one with Brett and with, one without? Because, well, I, I wouldn't be surprised since you have a different um, different label, different, different yeah. bottle with, with the same name. So it's basically the same beer, but one has been Brett. Let me check. That's what I'm thinking. Because I do remember seeing yours too, and then I'm like, mm-hmm. uh, did I choose wrong? Yeah, you know case? what? There are two different versions. Um, there you go. Yeah, one with Britannomyces specifically. Uh, it just well, it's the same beer with with yeah. Yeah, it just says age with Britannomyces. So it's not it's not that strong though. It's very very light if there is some or any. But sometimes it's just it, that's the only thing you're going to be tasting. Mm-hmm. And it's way too much. I'm like in my opinion. Not, not on this one. It's very light. That's cool. Very delicate. Yeah, I mean the base beer obviously without the Brett is quite nice, and I can imagine the Brett being a really nice. Um, added layer to that and uh, a little bit different of a wrinkle. Yeah. Pretty cool. They're definitely oh, the foam is, is a brewery pretty amazing. Um, that I, I recognize their name uh, very readily. Uh, I don't know how much of their beers make it down here, but um, they're one of the better known uh Quebec breweries for for me at least. Yeah, and to, on on a personal level, I would strongly recommend that you guys uh, try them out. If whenever you go into Saint Jean or Montreal, it, it's completely worth to go. It's very fun, and they always have a lot of different beers that they're trying out that they they're not necessarily bottling. So um, I I've, I've never tasted a beer that I disagreed, you know, that much that I didn't want to drink again. Seriously, like they're 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 making very good and fun product too cool so it's very worth it yeah and it's accessible it's not very pricey on our end too they're making it accessible i uh, i do have to appreciate that as well it's always important yeah all right should we uh should we jump into this last one let's do it i know this is a a favorite style of yours oh yes and this one specifically is is one of my uh, personal favorite and uh, Trou du Diable, uh, I would actually talk to them in a very similar way than uh, Don Dieu Dieu that you, uh, that we ju- uh, not Don Dieu, sorry, uh, Dieu du Ciel that we just drank. 
very similar brewery in my opinion with uh they make very different beers mm -hmm. but with the same approach same uh funkiness same openness to all sorts of different yeast uh ingredients and especially hops i know they've been using all sorts of weird hops that nobody does so uh, kudos to that so this is um and not not the three devils what is the middle word there le trou du diable uh, le trou du diable yeah it would be the uh, the hole of the devil the hole the, yeah the devil's uh <laughs> the devil's place where he's hiding right okay that's where the devil is hiding okay so it's like a hole in the ground is a true oh. so true to the got it. it yeah all right so this is called and then uh, the four surfers of the apocalypse surfers. or what is it in french exactly the four surfers of the apocalypse mm -hmm. and uh, apocalypse I'm, I'm i think they're referring to the hops that they're using in this case because it's very um very close to uh what american hops can get in terms of tropical fruit and uh, passion fruit and all sorts of uh, of those flavoring. So I know this is a style um, that you like a lot, uh, white IPA, but honestly, I don't think I could tell you yeah. what a white IPA is, and I've been brewing beer for a pretty good amount of time. So how would you describe yeah. a white IPA? So white IPAs traditionally, as far as I understand it, they're uh, mainly based and done with, uh, um, what's it called? Like a wet beer yeast, um, yeah, wet beer yeast. So they're they're usually very thick. You can't really see through them. They're very very hazy, um, and they have this specific grain type of of flavoring uh, that is a bit different than uh, when you go with uh, with other ones that are very common as well. Um, yeah, and in th in this case, since it's a uh, I don't know. If you put make it and, and put it next to a uh, pale ale, mm -hmm. you're gonna see how fuzzy it is next to it. That's that's for me. And usually the um, I have all the French words in my mouth right now. It's just <laughs> no, it's not coming out. I'm sorry. Um, but you would describe it essentially um, a how, wit beer. How the bubbles are usually, yeah, Go a ahead. wit beer, but that you have turned the hops up quite a bit and made this. You married a Belgian style wit beer and an American IPA together. Yeah. Okay. In this case, yeah, since it's a somewhat of a double, triple white IPA. Um, so this one is uh, six point seven, six point five percent, and I know that in the past they've made different versions of this beer, and I've tasted some that were much stronger than this than other ones. Oh, and I can see the yeast is pretty thick at the bottom of the bottle. In this case, yeah, I don't okay, know on quite your a end. Mine. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah very present but uh the the smell of it for me it's just this is this is what love smells <laughs> uh i don't have the a smell that's that that citra flavoring that that tropical fruit flavoring i have some kind of date code but i don't know how to interpret it uh it looks like 5 15 19 maybe so maybe there's uh, for the dates, huh? Yeah, I'm not super sure. Um, it doesn't. I'm not sure either. It doesn't seem super fresh, but it still has some nice hop character to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a very fun beer in my opinion. Like, uh, it's 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 lighter than it it it, it tastes very heavy, mm -hmm. but it's actually lighter than, than than what it tastes like. So it really it's a mouthful pleasure mouthful presence you can't ignore it you're like oh oh that's what i'm having right now like you you can't just go and be oh yeah that's just typical beer i'm having every day it's like no it's very present i like it that kind of wakes you up you're like oh yeah i like that it's um it, it has the the wit beer character but the hops that they use are very tropical and the the, the way that those two flavors marry together uh, are really nice for me yeah i wouldn't be able to tell you if it's their um 
most known one probably not it's just a personal favorite when it comes but it, they're making all sorts of like really cool product as well there's there's nothing that i tasted from them that was like oh that's disappointing um they have albert three uh, boisson d'avril uh all sorts of uh very funny as well there's been one that's been very known from them that's called the shiwinigan handshakes uh handshake and you see the devil uh, shaking the hand of uh, Prime Minister uh, Jean Chrétien. They used to be Prime Minister for, of Canada for over 10 years, I'd say, like a couple of mandates. And um, he came from Shawinigan, right? And at some point of his career, he, he was uh, stuck into a mob of people that was a manifestation. And he actually punched uh, a guy that wanted to shake his hand. <laughs> And so that's why they made a beer of with his face and the <laughs> devil next to him. And it's called the Shawinigan handshake. <laughs> and he actually loves it. He loves it a lot. Like everybody thinks that it's, it's a disgrace that these things exist. But and so if you look at their their I'll, I'll see if I can try to show some. But they, they're all very funny. That's which very, prime very minister pleasant. was this? Uh, Jean Chrétien. That's uh, a couple of years ago now. But uh see if i can show a couple of those i don't know if you guys are seeing it right yeah in, in the middle bottom, bottom right there. there yeah 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 oh, look, look, out of your side there we go yeah so yeah it's it's hard to show but uh it's it's very very fun and, and funny if you guys ever have a chance to go on their website i'm sure you can actually find uh, some images they've been making uh and, and on the left actually on the other side you could see uh, where it's actually brewed it's uh one of the old uh place that they they remade uh, for it pretty cool so yeah 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 you have any idea what that building used to be uh let me see if it's mentioned actually that's a very interesting uh i i always want to go there it really looks like an old church to be honest i'm not sure if that's it but it looks like uh, one of the old church that might be used nowadays for other purposes uh, that's one thing too in uh, Quebec province there used to be a lot of churches like so many churches and nowadays people don't go to to the prayer as they used to so uh, they're doing other stuff like condos and all sorts of stuff with them right so I I, I have a feeling that's what it looks like but I I might be wrong but yeah they've been uh, they're not too serious on that. Like they're not trying to do anything that resembles anything. They're just doing their own thing. And in my opinion, like that's great. I really appreciate that. Yeah, really if good. I want to go for something classical, I'm not going to go with them. Right. But if I want to go with something fun, always going to have fun discovering a new taste with them. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's really nice. A lot of research comes down to that. Like it's a, uh, those brewers are pretty established, obviously, and then one of the reasons why they are is that they're very, they're fun. To, of course, they're, they're they're very passionate, and but they've they've mostly all studied in Belgium mm-hmm. when it comes down to how to manage yeast and how to manage and brew. Basically, that's all they learn, and they they're bringing back all this knowledge here. Cool, man. So how do you feel like the four beers that we picked, um, do you feel like they are a good representative sample of, uh, of Quebecois beers? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, of course, we're not going down with Molson's and stuff, but I think they do represent uh, the more classical representation of the Belgian beers and uh, some of the uh, influences that are from Ireland and uh, Great Britain. Uh, we don't have any dark ones uh, here, uh, but we do also make very, very good darker stout uh, that are very, very fun. I actually had one uh, last week. I went to Sutton. There's a microbrewery there that's the, that brews a chocolate stout that's about 12% alcohol. It's a big beer. It's the, the, the most delicious beer that I've tasted in a long time. It's fun. It, the, the, the chocolate taste just mixes so well with the stout and the porter and all of the presents it's super creamy and you you never notice the alcohol it's just it's fun it's delicate it's nothing too strong it's 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 very fun so we haven't got any of those like very funky and fun ones mm-hmm. but i feel those people those group really influence everything that came after them that's for sure uh unibrew 
and 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 everybody else that's been there for at least like 15 years uh really influenced the making of all the micro breweries that are now available everywhere where do you see the scene in uh, quebec heading in the future what do, what do you think's coming up um well on my end i'm working with the uh the amateur brewing scene so uh, what what I'm seeing is uh, all of the funkiness and all of the people that are learning uh, to be brewers on their own and uh, going to courses and, 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 and going to learning, this learning process, and then later on becoming a professional as well. Mm -hmm. This is where we all start, right? Um, it's not everyone that starts uh, as an amateur that becomes a professional. It's not in everybody's goals either. Um but of course, every professional was first of all an amateur, and in the amateur scene, um, there is a lot of very cool trends and very cool experiences that have been going on, and hence why I wanted to be implicated and I wanted to have a chance to look at what's going on. So, uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot uh, that needs to be better, and 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 one of the things that I'm seeing is that the ingredients here. Uh, accessibility is much better than it was. It's not only uh, a European uh, hops and European uh, grains that are now available, it's from everywhere, especially from here. We're now growing uh, specialized grains for the microbreweries and for the microbrewers, mm -hmm. which which is pretty awesome. Like uh, So it, it brings back an idea that uh, agriculture at that level can actually be profitable and uh it's actually happening for them so yeah that's that's cool that's that's very fun that's uh that makes it so it's not uh, all of the molsons of this world and labat and the big ones that are just selling and making the money it makes it so those beers are becoming more and more available in places where they weren't mm -hmm. basically well for sure the best uh barley malting barley grown in north america is grown in canada i, I know maybe not in quebec necessarily but um most of the best two row in North America comes out of Canada. So, I mean, it makes sense that uh, you'd be growing uh, specialty grains or, or different, uh, different, uh, you know, brewing grains for, uh, for brewing purposes. Yeah. And I mean, it's a worldwide thing too. It's not, it's, it's not specific to here. We're very influenced by what's going on in the South of the United States right now. You look at the, the Florida scene, you look at what's going on in Dallas, you would look at what's going on in Vancouver. If ever you have a chance to go there, those people are wild. If ever you have a chance to taste whatever they're brewing right now, it's fun. It's amazing. It's it's out of this the spectrum of what you usually do go and, and taste in terms of what's classical, but it's well done too. It's not just doing funky thing just to be funky, mm -hmm. right? It's it's just it's very well done and the accessibility of water it's obviously something that's very important when brewing beer and Quebec has the opportunity to be held holding a very high percentage of the uh soft water and accessible drinkable water in this world so it's it's you know one of the things that we're rich of it's water mm -hmm. for sure and most of the montreal breweries are using uh great lakes water right uh well great lakes that goes into the saint laurent river and then uh yeah, but 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 not more than that, actually, there's so many different sources here. I'm not even sure if they're actually using uh, Saint Laurent River. Okay, it's it's from every yeah, it's from deep under too. It's everywhere. There's like all sorts of river flowing over and under the earth, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so every every municipality have access to very very deep rivers that have been flowing for thousands and thousands of years. Are uh, that are very pure and and perfect when it comes to be brewing beers mm -hmm. for a very cheap price. Cool. Well, uh, I think we covered all the beers, and um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we have any extra questions from chat. But uh, I want to thank you again for joining for this week and powering through our initial technical difficulties. We got that all squared away. Um, next, all good. Next month, um, I've talked to a uh, small um, malter that we buy malt from. And he said that he's interested in coming on and talking about running a uh, basically a small malt house and all of the 
trials and tribulations that go into that and producing malt on a smaller level. And uh, so we should be able to schedule that for uh, maybe somewhere around the middle of November. We'll have to see in terms of uh, obviously Thanksgiving. You guys already had Canadian Thanksgiving a couple of weeks ago, but yeah. our Thanksgiving <laughs> still coming up. So we'll, we'll schedule around that, but I'll definitely post details up on the page and uh, tweet when that stuff's coming out. Uh, Giggle, thank you again for joining, and uh, cheers. Hey, thank you very much for the invitation. It's very, very appreciated yeah. once again. And I do have already questions for this guy because uh, it's it's a very interesting topic, and I hope that everybody that watches uh, the stream today or tomorrow within the next couple of days will actually uh, will be there for the next stream as well because uh, this is a very interesting topic. Thank you again yeah. for the cheers, invitation. Man. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. And like I said, I'll put up details about... Um, next month and uh, hope to see you then. All right.